So the exhibition, Building a New New World, Americanism in Russian Architecture, examines how, from the 19th century until the end of the Soviet Union, the defining moments in Russian history have been shaped uh, by a set of idealized representations uh, of the politics, technology, urbanism, uh, architecture, and visual culture of America. Curator Jean-Louis Cohen explains that the Americanism in the title of the exhibition should be understood as a phantasmagoria. It's, what he means by this is that Russian political thinkers, writers, and uh, architects experienced ideal images of the new world as a sequence of fantasies. This continuum of visual and textual representations generated a collective illusion that shaped Russian modernization. So the exhibition rewrites the history of Russian architecture and urban design using this enduring Americanism. It takes an expanded definition of architecture and culture that encompasses industrial and graphic design, music, photography, film, and literature. So for the series of lectures called Search for a New New World, we move from the phantasmagoria of the new world to fantasies of other worlds and of our own world transformed by fantastic progress. The Russian Revolution itself has been compared to a science fictional jump over the present directly to a radical future. It was supposed to happen in industrialized France or Germany, even England, but curiously it occurred in a rural empire on the edge of Europe, almost untouched by modernity. This gap was responsible for many productive paradoxes, as well as the intensive search for models of modernity uh, to learn from and surpass, like America. And sci-fi played a key role as a shared space of reflection on what was and wasn't possible in Russian reality and how to imagine ways of thinking beyond it. Its stories can be read as sites of contested attitudes towards science and technology and their roles in the production of a new world. The creation of science fiction involves scientists, philosophers, activists, journalists, and others beyond the literary community. And this dangerous combination of critical capacity and mass engagement of educated professionals was one of the reasons that Stalin banned artistic speculation before uh, beyond the so-called realistic uh, near future. So as we look at Russian sci-fi for competing ideas of modernity, coming from a culture and especially a political context that's very different from ours, let's keep in mind that 20th century American, Canadian, sci-fi offers just as many revelations, nightmares, and magical leaps over intractable social, political, and ecological problems. And so does contemporary sci-fi. Look at the desperate excitement around SpaceX, or to put it another way, consider that humanity went from uh, the scientific achievement and political feat of launching Sputnik to launching a Tesla into orbit as a commercial stunt, or colonizing Mars, which some uh, morally limited architects blithely compare to the discovery and colonization of the new world, or stories of proletarian rebellion in video games like The Outer Worlds, or the technosexual politics of a TV show like Westworld. So I invite you to keep in mind how these fantasies uh, can offer lenses to look at contemporary issues, including those that are fundamental to architecture and urbanism. So over four lectures, uh, we're following the chronology of the exhibition, uh, beginning with pre-revolutionary urban uh, dystopias, the Bolsheviks' interest in cosmic pathology, the afterlives of Soviet sci-fi films, some of which uh, were exported to America, and 1970s fantasies of life in space, where even the Cold World superpowers might get along. The first lecture uh, by Matthias Schwartz explored how pre-revolutionary science fiction often returned to St. Petersburg as a kind of decadent and doomed city, an open wound facing Europe where all kinds of cultural contagion can enter the national body with potentially apocalyptic consequences. And tonight we're continuing with the next episode, The Bolsheviks and a Turn Upwards to the Stars. Our guide is going to be Asif Siddiqui, professor of history at Fordham University and a specialist on the history of science and technology and modern Russia, on modernities in the colonial and post colonial context, particularly in South Asia, and on global histories of science and technology. Asif was a member of the United States National Research Council's Committee on Human Spaceflight, the Charles A. Lindbergh Chair in Aerospace History at the, in the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum, the Eleanor Searle Visiting Professor of History at Caltech and the Huntington Library, and a John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation Fellow. His published books include Challenge to Apollo, The Soviet Union and the Space Race, 1945 to 1974, and The Red Rocket's Glare, Spaceflight and the Soviet Imagination, 1857 to 1957. His two current book projects, 
uh, first, uh, science and expertise in Stalin's gulag, and uh, the second is an investigation of the more than two dozen places on Earth where humans created communities and infrastructures to launch objects off the planet, uh, with a focus on the history of the Indian space program. Not sure how he found the time to come here, but I'm very glad he did. Uh, thank you for your attention, and please join me in welcoming Asif Siddiqui. Okay, so thanks to Lev and thanks to the Canadian Center for Architecture for having me here. I'm really excited to be able to share some of my work and um, particularly on this topic, which I've um, worked on for a long time. So, uh, cosmic enthusiasm in Bolshevik Russia. Um, space achievements represented an important marker of Soviet claims to global prominence uh, during the Cold War. In books, movies, uh, posters, songs, Soviet authorities sang, sometimes literally, the glories of their space program. Cosmonauts and artifacts toured the world using rhetoric that conflated mastery of space with mastery of nature. During and after the Cold War, both Russian and Western historians underlined the connection between the Soviet space program and Marxist fascinations with technology. These lo accounts located the social and cultural um, origins of the space program as part of the project of modernization, uh, secularization, progress, these sorts of things. And when the first hero cosmonauts flew into space in the early 60s, Soviet commentators repeatedly depicted them as emblematic, uh, emblematic of a modern and technologically sophisticated Russia overtaking the West. And unlike American astronauts who thanked God for their successes, Soviet cosmonauts were explicitly atheistic. One of the first cosmonauts, the young uh, German Titov, famously declared on a visit to the United States that during his 17 orbits of the Earth, he had seen no God or angels, adding, uh, quote unquote, no God helped build our rocket. Um, Titov's claim about not seeing God was at one level a missive launched into the cultural battle of the Cold War, suggesting that the cold heart, suggesting that cold heart rationality was what won the day in the era of Sputniks, cosmonauts, and Yuri Gagarin. But his invocation of the rocket in the same breath as God suggests another possible framing in the way many Russians understood the cosmos that the commitment to the cosmos was steeped in ambiguity, a continuity that encompassed both God and machine. So in order to trace the wispy remains of this continuum, I'd like to take us back to the immediate decade after the Bolshevik Revolution to the 1920s and early 30s, when cosmic enthusiasm seemed to burst through the curtains in the theater of Soviet life. The core of this cosmic imagination in the aftermath of the Bolshevik Revolution is often traced back to a so-called patriarch of Soviet cosmonautics, uh, a person named Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, who in 1903, way before the revolution, produced the first mathematical substantiations that spaceflight was possible. To the Bolsheviks, Tsiolkovsky's ideas were a perfect vehicle for catapulting Russia into the modern technological age of Ford and Taylor. Soon, inspired by Tsiolkovsky, young men and women joined together to build rockets. In the 1920s and 30s, Tsiolkovsky's ideas on space exploration fed enormous popular interest in the cause of cosmic travel. With little or no support from the state, amateur and te technically minded enthusiasts formed short-lived societies to discuss their interests and exchange information. Some put up impressive exhibitions to discuss, uh, to displaying their visions of the future and also displaying the visions of Tsiolkovsky and also uh, the American rocket pioneer Robert Goddard and the German Hermann Obert. In the popular media, the advocates wrote about the power of technology to improve and remake society. On the cultural front, the science fiction of Alexei Tolstoy, the paintings of the suprematists, uh, Yakov Protazanov's famous interplanetary movie, Aelita, the various exhibitions, all engaged in a vigorous discussion where a kind of technological optimism collided and often merged with metaphysical ideas of the place of humanity in the cosmos. These embryonic, artistic, philosophical, and cultural explorations were important, not only because they underlined an interest in the power of modern science, but also because they disseminated ideas about space travel that were not simply about the march of modernity. Like the Soviet experiment itself, they were deeply ambiguous and yet liberatory in ethos. So I want to talk a little bit about Russian utopianism, which is a vast topic, uh, I could take hours, but I'll just su summarize a little bit. Russian utopian thought, which has a long history predating Bolshevism, Marxism, and indeed the 19th century, encompassed uh, everything from secular ideas to explicitly theological conceptions. Uh, 
Uh, already before the revolution of 1917, Russian utopian philosophy incorporated both Marxist notions and 20th century modernist ideals of science and technology. The revolution, however, the revolution of 1917, allowed these kinds of utopian visions to move from the wisp of dreams to the arena of possibility. After 1917, an ostensibly secular brand of millenarianism entered the picture. And the richest uh, expressions of this kind of uh, ethos was during the years of NEP, the new economic policy of the 1920s, uh, when, as many authors have studied, there was a kind of an upsurge of optimism among uh, many in, in, uh, post in Soviet Russia. Um, with urban renewal accelerating and the first fruits of the revolution appearing, people conjured up old dreams of utopia in new and experimental ways, from ritual to religion, mannerisms to machine, and art to architecture. Utopian thought pervaded society at all levels. The utopian discussions of the period were not monolithic. In fact, their very contradictions and illogic often gave the social experimentation a rich and expansive tenor. But in the 1920s, technology played a major role in the social conjuring, debating, and enabling of these utopias. Prominent voices of, intelli of the intelligentsia, as well as Bolshevik leaders, engaged in this discourse. And indeed, their pronouncements reflected the same types of tensions between naivete and pragmatism, emblematic of the larger discussions about the future of the Soviet Union. And Lenin's fascination with electrification, which perhaps some of you are familiar with, uh, in which he said communism equals Soviet power plus electrification, kind of embodied this, this kind of um, ethos. Um, uh, many historians, including Richard Stites and others, have pointed to a Russian interest in aviation, which held a very broad fascination in the Soviet population in the 1920s as, quote, a kinetic metaphor for liberation, unquote. And these are two covers of uh, popular journals uh, from the late 20s and early 30s communicating this kind of um, the liberatory power of aviation. Aviation represented a mixture of modernity and liberation that proved irresistible to many Bolsheviks. They appropriated its symbolic meanings to encourage and inculcate ideas about a new world and used it to bridge the literal and metaphorical gaps between the urban and rural masses. And as people's eyes looked upwards, they sought to look higher and higher and higher into the infinite expanse and finally into the cosmos. So the, the part of the, because the core of this talk really is, is focused on what uh, many have called a kind of space fad in the 1920s and 1930s. Uh, this space fad was similar in nature to uh, cultural uh, production in other European countries, particularly in Germany and Austria and uh, Britain. But the Soviet cosmic enthusiasm of the 1920s was distinguished both by its diversity of perspectives and its deep historical legacy. The Soviet space fad of the 1920s literally carved out a space for Russia in the pantheon of leading nations to explore space. Thus, when Sputnik was launched in 1957, for most Russians, it was an entirely expected event. Who else but Russia would be first into space? Um, it's a misconception to assume that the Soviet cosmic enthusiasm of the 20s emerged fully formed, and that its origins coincided with the revolution of 1917. In fact, Russian fascination with the cosmos can be traced far back to Western science fiction novels which were imported into the 19th century. Writers such as Jules Verne, Camille Flammarion, uh, Henri Henri de Graffini were widely read by a growing middle class in the 19th century. And soon native Russian writers producing both fiction and popular science took over the baton and excitedly reported to locals such sensational news as the claims of American astronomer Percival Lowell, who claimed that Mars was the home to an advanced but now dead civilization that had built canals. And these kinds of um, diagrams were very common in magazines around the turn of the century. Yet the fascination with space did not become a mass phenomena until after 1917, and there are several reasons for this. First, the new Bolshevik leaders of the Soviet Union fully embraced a modernist impulse in bringing their nation into the 20th century. And although the Bolsheviks saw themselves as hard-headed realists, they did not close off discussions uh, uh, of the frequently utopian earnings of an emerging generation of young people. Um, another reason for the renewed interest in space was news from abroad. As I mentioned, the American rocketry pioneer Robert Goddard, the German Hermann Obert, these are very active uh, individuals in the 1920s. They published quite a bit. Their works were disseminated widely. And as news of their work, sometimes distorted in rather unexpected ways, made their way to the Soviet Union, young people were inspired to discuss, popularize, and even to look for native Russians who might have been thinking along similar lines. <clears throat> 
News of Foreign Achievements was in fact a call to action that roused the, uh, the most important Russian theorist of space exploration, Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, who I mentioned. It will be impossible to recount the origins of Soviet cosmic fascination without invoking the name of Tsiolkovsky. Um, he was, uh, as I mentioned, the first person to come up with the mathematical formulas for space travel. He was a self-educated polymath who taught for many years at a girls' school in the city of Kaluga. Um, he had also produced a number of science fiction works that were very popular. Um, and here are um, some press clippings from the 19, the one on the left is um, an, uh, an article about Tsiolkovsky from 1926 in which he speculates about how to fly to the moon. And this is in a very popular uh, weekly magazine called Agonia. Um, now, Tsiolkovsky had uh, very difficult years after the revolution. He was actually arrested by the secret police on charges of treason uh, in 1919 uh, and spent a brief time in prison. Uh, he was promised a stipend, then lost it. He was given an honorary membership in the Socialist Academy of Social Sciences, but then it, abruptly the membership was revoked. So he, had, uh, he struggled a lot. Uh, he was nearly destitute in the early 1920s. Yet a group of his most vociferous supporters came to his aid and actively popularized his words. When news of Robert Goddard and Hermann Obert came into Soviet Russia, many were indignant that the uh, Russian government, uh, Russian authorities never recognized Tsiolkovsky. And so they republished his works, claiming entirely rightly that he had preempted both of the foreigners by decades. Now, one asp aspect of Tsiolkovsky's life was his deep interest in mysticism and the occult. Uh, beginning about um, 1920 or so, he published these self-published monographs with really enigmatic and strange titles, which you can see here, The Wealth of the Universe, uh, The Origins of Life on Earth, etc., etc. These were very small booklets in which he meditated on a particular uh, type of future uh, which has its roots in mysticism and the occult, really influenced by theosophy, uh, people like Madame Blavatsky and Carl Duprell. And he imagined that a world in which we might, uh, that when we die, our particles go out into space, and perhaps we could reanimate them and bring uh, dead people back to life. It's a very sort of deeply, um, as I said, mystical and occult view of cosmic, uh, the cosmic future. Um, as many of you probably know, uh, similar ideas were circulated by another uh, very famous um, Russian philosopher of the late 19th century, Nikolai Fyodorov, who also imagined a world in which humans would have to leave the planet Earth. And uh, although his argument was that it's essentially a Malthusian argument where we would exhaust the resources and we would have to go out into space. But there was some um, overlap between the two, although it's not entirely clear how Tsiolkovsky may or may not have been influenced by Fyodorov. Um, but either way, these sorts of ideas were circulating also in the 20s. And through my talk, I'll come back and sometimes uh, refer to them in the way that there was a kind of an alternative to the hard rationalist technological view of the cosmos. There was also what I would call maybe a metaphysical, uh, perhaps mystical, perhaps even occult view of the cosmos. It was not a coherent ideology. There were not coherent uh, sort of uh, uh, disciplines in support of it, but it was these, this kind of mentalité was certainly in the air at this time. Um, Having said that, one of the people who did popularize Tsiolkovsky was um, a, 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 a gentleman by the name of Yakov Pirelman. Uh, why do I mention him? His name is mostly forgotten, uh, largely, because of, we tend to think of Tsiolkovsky. But uh, my argument, I think, is that without uh, popularizers of science, it was almost impossible. We might not even have seen uh, Tsiolkovsky's fame, because it was people like Pirelman uh, tireless promoters of science and translating science into popular science that we get to see some of his actual work uh, disseminate into the larger uh, uh, social spheres. Uh, Perelman's books were, uh, he'd written thousands uh, of articles and several hundred books throughout his career, uh, many of them dedicated to Tsiolkovsky. Uh, he wrote what was probably the world's first serious book on space travel, published in 1915 under the title Interplanetary uh, Travel. And he was also one of the first to publicize the pioneering work of Tsiolkovsky, sustaining a, and he maintained a correspondence with Tsiolkovsky that lasted decades. Um, in the evolution of Russian uh, cosmic thinking, Perelman was important for many reasons, but for, principally for the first time, he began to link space exploration with the science of rocketry, two systems of knowledge that had little or no overlap until then. 
He also introduced the notion that uh, somebody like Siolkovsky, who was uh, a self-educated village school teacher and not a, uh, an elite scientist, could be a successful and a genius. So the, in, in that way, he communicated the power of maybe uh, Russian culture and Russian peasant culture, too. And later in his life, Perelman was a senior writer at some of the most popular science journals uh, in Soviet Russia, uh, where he explained in clear language the possibilities inherent in modern technology. And according to modest estimates, 13 million copies of his books reached, young, uh, reached millions of young impressionable Russians in the early 20th century. And these are some the covers of some of his books, which I think uh, the covers themselves communicate a kind of uh, a sense of motion and moving forward. Uh, uh, very simple and elegant uh, depictions of the future of rockets and space. As one might expect, uh, dissemination of these ideas about space travel depended also on a very vibrant media, which the Soviet Union had in the 1920s. Publishers, both private and public, found that scientific titles were particularly popular among urban masses. And uh, some historians have uh, done studies on this and found that um, at least one fifth of all titles published in Soviet Russia in the 1920s were focused on science and technology. And there was a whole plethora of journals with very lovely and enigmatic titles that populated the newsstands, journals with titles like Technology and Life, Technology for Youth, In Nature's Workshop, Knowledge is Power, I Want to Know All. Uh, these journals had a distinctly pedagogical approach to their audience. And, um, and in one of the advertisements, we are here to help readers to develop a material understanding of the world. Um, and so I wanted to show you some of the, what these magazines looked like, some of their covers and how um, uh, um, futuristic in, in, a, in, a, in, in some ways they looked. Um, these are covers uh, from the 1920s. Uh, then we have some very explicit space-themed uh, special issues. Uh, and again, you can see the, the, the vibrant colors and the imagination here about a human being on another planet. Um, also, what it's like to survive weightlessness on, on the cover on the right uh, and perhaps step out into open space and conduct a spacewalk. That's from 1929. Um, uh, other magazines, these are things you would buy very cheaply on the newsstand. Um, showing rockets flying over planets and moons. Um, this was a very a special issue dedicated entirely, um, the entire issue was dedicated to uh, space flight from 1932. Again, uh, this, um, the semblance of motion and forward movement. Um, and um, this is um, a, a special issue showing, uh, a, a, essentially describing the story of humans in outer space and how you might survive a week-long mission to the moon. Um, also, technology for youth, another um, uh, special issue. Uh, in terms of the, um, the content uh, of this, uh, this stuff, um, this is um, uh, showing, I think uh, you can probably tell, it's perhaps uh, me meant for a certain um, age demographic in which we might uh, imagine something like this appealing. Uh, during a flight by inertia in airless space, the passengers will absolutely not feel any loads, meaning a, sort of a cumbersome way to talk about feeling weightlessness uh, and things like that. Um, um, this is a, um, from 1932, and this is, has a kind of interesting take. There's an there's a old gentleman with sideburns looking at something that Tsiolkovsky has written, and he says, this smells like revolution, and there's a priest in the back uh, also sort of condemning this. So uh, in a sense, suggesting that Tsiolkovsky's idea could uh, are revolutionary and that they're against religion and kind of uh, um, in, in a more modernist kind of uh, sense of the word. Um, these are further uh, depictions of um, uh, gigantic futuristic airplanes that fly out into space, not, not necessarily even for uh, the atmosphere. Uh, one of my favorites is imagining, uh, this is on a special issue from 1929 that, which was devoted to what it's like to walk on the moon. On the moon, a person experiences a peculiar feeling of lightness. With a small jump, he makes a leap of 30 meters. And this is a kind of a five-panel cartoon uh, meant essentially for kids uh, about a voyage of the starship Yunt, a fantastic story without words in which um, um, these kids get together and build a spaceship and they fly to the moon. 
but it's revealed at the end that this was a, a dream and they, they fall out of their beds. Uh, how to interpret this, I'm not exactly sure, but I think we can probably, it's, it's a, an ambiguous ending in, in one sense, uh, whether to dream or not to dream, um, uh, and one could interpret it in many different ways. So, um, and one of the interesting aspects of all this discussion in popular magazines was that it also created uh, networks. In other words, it wasn't just a passive unidirectional thing, we're talking to you. Um, it's worth pointing out that Tsiolkovsky himself operated a, a kind of a massive international network of fans who wrote to him. And in many of his self-published monographs, he published his own address as well as the addresses of other people so they, people could write to each other. And Tsiolkovsky's papers now preserved in the archives of the Russian Academy of Sciences contain literally thousands of letters. I'm, I'm not even uh, I'm, uh, sort of exaggerating thousands of letters from disparate people who are categorized in folders under uh, mining engineers, anti-religious people, metal workers, judges, telegraph supervisors, booksellers, military officials, amateur inventors, atheists. And these are sort of self-described uh, things that people have described themselves when they wrote letters to Tsiolkovsky asking to learn about space. Um, another popularizer I want to quickly mention is a, is a person named Nikolai Rinin who was also a very well-known academic, very respected, uh, had a, uh, degrees uh, earned before the revolution. And like Perelman, he wrote much about space and also communicated with like-minded enthusiasts abroad. And Renan had also created uh, uh, an international network. He wrote regularly to Germans, Austrians, French, uh, Americans, uh, British. Um, and Renan particularly wrote to Robert Goddard and Hermann Oberth, asking them for the latest information on rockets in American and German uh, uh, in, in, in circles. Um, and Renan's greatest con contribution uh, undoubtedly was one of the greatest legacies of the space fad, which was a massive nine volume encyclopedia which he published, which were thick uh, volumes in between 1928 and 1932. They were called Interplanetary Communications. And there was nine of these volumes, which he self-published part partially. And this was a titanic work that sought to bring together everything written in any language about travel through space, including ancient folk tales, medieval speculations, and so on and so forth, uh, and going right up to Tsiolkovsky, Goddard, and Ober. Um, so besides having kind of, kind of a value as a memorialization of all things cosmic in the early 30s, uh, you know, the, the thing that I ev is evoked, I think, is Diderot's uh, Encyclopedia Enlightenment, Enlightenment, excuse me. Uh, it's a kind of update on that. Uh, so he produces this encyclopedia, which in turn helped to shape uh, many Russians' understanding of the possibilities of space life, but also the history of space life. Renin produced an unbroken lineage from these sort of medieval fantasies and folk tales uh, right to the modern day uh, uh, of mathematics of Newton and Tsiolkovsky, producing a kind of holistic epistemology of space travel, one that was able to include both fantasy and reason in a single line. He also legitimized space travel as worthy of serious disciplinary concern that had its own boundaries, questions, and goals. Um, and as I said, he cre also finally created an international network. Many, many contributors contributed to this encyclopedia. This was a work of truly transnational scale and still remains to be studied. Um, so emboldened by the writings of people like Perelman and Renin, uh, many amateurs got together into societies to discuss their interests and exchange information on space travel. And these societies, the first in the world, uh, before any had formed in either Germany or the US, for example, uh, operated largely without material support from the government. Um, uh, they absorbed official Marxist discourses on the positivist role of technology uh, as a panacea for all social ills, but they infused it with their own uh, special spin. One of the most notable such organizations was the Society for the Study of Interplanetary Communications, which was formed in 1924 by a student group at the Zhukovsky Air Fleet Academy in Moscow. And um, they um, organized, one of the things they did was they organized lectures like this, and I found lots of interesting bits and pieces of these, the lecture series they organized in 1924. Uh, one of the first lectures they organized with this flyer, which was put up uh, all over Moscow, uh, which was called um, Interplanetary Travel, How Modern Science and Technology Solves This Question. And the lecture was given by a man named Mikhail lapirov Skoblo, who actually was a senior Bolshevik official and actually knew Lenin himself. Uh, this event was held at the Polytechnic Museum in Moscow. 
uh, tickets sold out two days before the event. And on the day of the lecture, uh, museum administrators were forced to call the police because so many people showed up and wanted to attend. And nearly 180 people from the audience paid dues to join the society. I know this because I looked at the log books of how many people paid. Um, and they raised an astonishing 2,500 rubles from the event. Uh, one of the most memorable events hosted by the society was the result of a misreading. Um, rumor had it that Robert Goddard had launched a rocket to the moon and that he had done so on July 4th, 1924, Independence Day, obviously, in the United States. And as uh, prior to this, prior to July 4th, anticipation spread in Moscow that the rocket launch was impending and enthusiasts waited in bated breath. And yet as summer turned to fall, there was no news. And, but Goddard fever reached a peak. And so in early October, the society held a widely advertised talk by a well-known astronomer. Um, and this is Goddard himself, um, um, who was, as I said, a pioneer of American rocketry, but who was incredibly famous in Russia, and I don't think he had any idea. Um, this is uh, the flyer for the discussion about Goddard, Goddard's rocket, the truth on the dispatch of Professor Goddard's rocket to the moon on 4th uh, August 1924 in America. Uh, so the date has now been changed to August because now there's new, new, new news that uh, something different has occurred. The crowds, again, were so, um, so many that the Hort, uh, Moscow horse militia was called out to control the throngs. Um, so this, this was a, a part and parcel also, sort of amateur organization of lectures was part of it. But I want to move a little bit um, in the remainder of the lecture from this kind of maybe uh, uh, or, um, activity that's geared around, let's say, more... Uh, technical things and objects and artifacts and maybe the more sort of scientifically oriented work to uh, um, maybe the less formal domain, uh, uh, the less uh, normatively scientific domain of literature, art, film, and architecture and these kinds of other disciplines. Um, as pro probably many of you know, from literature to film to painting to poetry to architecture to language even, clusters of artists produced works that reflected their belief that cosmic travel was an inevitable part of, part of their future. And so I'm going to talk a little bit of just a small sampling of this because I, ca I can't really talk about all of it. But a small sampling of this output it includes um, science fiction, uh, movies, and uh, art will highlight, I think, some of the key dimensions of this cultural discourse in the 1920s. And I want to begin with literature, specifically science fiction. The most famous science fiction, uh, Soviet science fiction novel of the 1920s was probably Alexei uh, Tolstoy's Aelita. Uh, which had the subtitle Sunset of Mars. It was first published in serialized form in 1922 and 23, and remains the most famous space-themed science fiction work of the period. It also perfectly encapsulated the contradictory themes of space advocacy in the 1920s in the stories An Engineer and A Soldier Voyage to Mars, where the latter, the soldier, incites a proletarian revolution, it's the red planet after all, among the bourgeois Martians, um, Aelita is the queen of Mars, uh, and she's, um, she meets the soldier and the engineer. Anyway, she falls in love with the Red Army soldier, and then you know, shenanigans ensue. So uh, on, on one level, the novel incorporates many elements, I think, of post-revolutionary utopian science fiction. Uh, a bourgeois enemy, um, a socialist revolution, modern science and technology, adventure and romance, borrowed from you know, Edgar Rice Burroughs and these kinds of things, and also a little bit of utopian dreaming. Yet Aelita's narrative, narrative also hints a little bit of mysticism uh, and metaphysical ideas, especially ideas infused with theosophy and ancient uh, anthroposophic anthropoph uh, ideas, not dissimilar to the ones that uh, Fyodorov and Sielskovsky had been writing about. Um, as part of the Russian worldview, which nowadays I think is, uh, is called cosmism, but at the time people didn't really have a coherent term for it. Um, defending his position from critics who blamed him for being too emotional in the novel Tolstoy wrote, um, uh, this is the quote from him, art is an artistic creation. It appears momentarily like a dream. It has no place for logic because its goal is not to find a cause for some sort of event, but to give in all its fullness a living piece of the cosmos. So, end of quote. So, the, of course, uh, as also some of you know, um, um, the, the, there was a movie version made of Aelita, which appeared uh, almost a year after the print version and was directed by one of the great early Soviet directors, Yakov Pratizanov. Uh, 
Um, he had already been famous uh, before the revolution, uh, but he well, this was one of his first films after the revolution. And it was uh, released officially in September 1924 at the peak of this space fad that's going on. Uh, many uh, scholars have raised, uh, sorry, uh, have hailed Ailita as one of the most Soviet, important Soviet science fiction movies, perhaps the most important one. It contributed enormously to the popularization of space flight in Soviet culture in the 1920s. Um, weeks of intense advertising uh, preceded its release. Uh, kind of a, almost an early version of modern media blitz. Uh, airplanes dropped leaflets over Moscow announcing the opening and so on and so forth. Uh, tickets for the opening uh, night were sold out, which was very unusual at the time. And the size of the crowd uh, on that night was so big that the director couldn't actually get into the theater. Um, so this was the uh, original poster uh, for Ailita, and you can tell the, the, the figure on the top is the queen. Um, um, in drawing from Tolstoy's novel, because this is an adaptation of a novel, Pratizanov transformed the story into a much more ambiguous and I think beautiful parable that communicated a veiled message about the state of Soviet culture during this time of great uncertainty of the 1920s. Um, it's, a, it's a silent film, uh, but it's also an early example of a modernistic uh, uh, aesthetic in world cinema, prefiguring, I think, many of the tropes that we later find in such movies as Metropolis by Fritz Lang. Uh, so I think it, it had a huge influence far beyond its small run in 1924. But the plot itself, as I mentioned, is rather ambiguous. Um, Alita's triumph has less to do with its plot, partly because the plot itself is revealed um, at the end that it was all a dream, essentially that this, this person, Loss, L-O-S, Loss, who is the main character in the mo movie, um, has some marriage troubles, and he's attracted to this queen, uh, um, or this, uh, this message coming from Mars, this kind of signal message, and he finally builds a ship and he goes to Mars and he meets the queen. And then there's all sorts of, uh, there's a kind of a revolution that happens, the queen oversees a whole uh, nation, or a, I guess a planet of workers, and the workers rise up. Uh, eventually the queen um, squashes this uh, rebellion, and uh, he wakes up and uh, he realizes this is all a dream and he goes back to his domestic life. So um, there was a lot of, uh, critique of the movie even when it came out in 1924 and it was re-released again in 1929. People found it ambig too ambiguous for kind of the more uh, uplifting revolutionary rhetoric since the revolution had failed on Mars. And second of all, it was a dream anyway. So uh, all these things kind of suggested that it wasn't clear-eyed uh, clear enough for um, Soviet audiences. Uh, the film was, but as I said, the, in, in its initial run, it was hugely inf influential, but as the 1930s went on and, you know, high Stalinism comes in, it fell victim to censorship for the exact reasons that I suggested. It was too ambiguous, and it was eventually banned. Um, one interesting aside uh, of this is that, uh, well, let me just uh, show some, um, um, these are stills that were published um, in 1924, um, at the time when the movie was being made. So this was sort of building anticipation for the movie. This, uh, Isaac Rabinovich was the uh, a set designer uh, for the movie. Um, and, and these are uh, stills of the actors uh, who are now, who are then filming this movie. Uh, Yulia Soltseva was the main actress who played the queen. Um, and this is uh, uh, stills from the actual movie. You can see the queen on the right. Um, and here, uh, a bit better, uh, well, you can see the costume of the queen here. Um, these are two characters on Mars. That The, one, the woman on the right is the, one of the queen's assist assistants, and the man on the left is a kind of uh, fiendish advisor that the queen has. Um, he's quite fiendish. Anyway, uh, uh, this is, um, interestingly, a, a, a very sort of handsome, dashing man who works for the queen, but the queen is very attracted to him. Uh, because the queen has a telescope with which she looks at earth life uh, and she finds that um, earth couples um, are, can be intimate and she wants to be intimate with this man saying, will, will you kiss me like uh, earth couples do? And the guy is kind of befuddled by this, uh, hence the awkward kiss here. Um, so, but, um, and uh, this is the, the, final, the poster for the re-release, which was in 1929, which I think is even more... Uh, striking in its aesthetic, uh, was um, um, painted by Israel Bograd, who unfortunately died in the purges, or shot in the purges. But, uh, so, um, but a lot of this uh, aesthetic um, is 
I think fascinating. One um, footnote to this, or I don't know what it is, um, one of the, uh, a bunch of people who were um, working um, at the U.S. Cesar State College of Cinematography um, decided that they wanted to make an animated movie and, uh, or uh, in, in sort of honor, or actually they originally proposed that there should be animation within the movie of Ailita, and uh, Patazanov, the director, said, no, it's too complicated. So they made their little animated movie, and uh, this is the poster for that. The movie, you, it's, actually, it's actually on YouTube, and it's a lovely, charming movie called Interplanetary Revolution. It's an eight-minute, uh, one of the first, I think, animated movies in space, but it's a, it has a kind of classic uh, plot, um, a Marxist plot of uh, proletarian rising up against the bourgeoisie. Um, another movie that also came out in the 19, this came out uh, about 10 years after Ailita, was a movie called Kosmicheski Race, which translates to Space Voyage. This was a less, uh, a more palatable under high Stalinism. This was directed by Vas Vasily Zhuravlyov, and the movie is essentially a very straight ahead narrative about the power of the Stalinist state. And um, um, in fact, the, um, the, the main, uh, the spaceship is called Joseph Stalin. Uh, so uh, I think that the director was like, I'm not you know, gonna be ambiguous, so this is gonna be. So, um, so in it, the, there's a voyage to the moon uh, that is uh, complicated by um, uh, you know, evildoers and so forth. But uh, the interesting, I think the interesting thing about the movie is one interesting thing is the sets again are very beautiful. Um, this is um, the launch, uh, I guess the, a sled, the rocket sort of climbs out of the sled and you can see the city in the back, the future city of Moscow. It's set in 1945. The movie is made in 1935, so it's imagining 10 years into the future. And uh, there's the spaceship Joseph Stalin and it rides off on the sled into outer space. Uh, one, uh, one interesting still I found, or while watching the movie, is this particular image, which I think uh, pre-echoes Kubrick's 2001 uh, on the surface of the moon. I thought it was very eerie how that was sort of evoked. Another interesting thing uh, about this movie is that this was a, a, a the director of this movie uh, basically contacted Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, the, the sort of forefather of a uh, space travel, who was quite old at the time, and he was, uh, and, uh, he was in his late 70s, and said, would you like to ad be a ad scientific advisor to the movie? And so in 1933, um, Tsiolkovsky drew these sketches, which I think are priceless, about humans might look like in space. And he titled this one, The Phenomena in the Rocket at the End of Firing, which is a fancy way of saying that you know, the rocket's gone into space, the engine has shut down, and so we're all weightless, and uh, very vivid drawings. Um, about what it might be like in a space station with the crew staring out into uh, space through the window, which also is very reminiscent of the International Space Station. Some of the NASA photographs are quite uh, reminiscent of this. Um, another sketch um, um, about spacewalking in outer space. Uh, all these sketches are a part of a, a, a monograph called The Album of Space Voyages, which is stored in the Academy of Arts, uh, sorry, the Russian Academy of Sciences archive. Um, um, so moving on, uh, film was not the only artistic medium that engaged with space exploration in the early 20th century. Soviet artists were captivated by the possibility of space travel. Uh, the most famous of them were the suprematists, which I think many of you probably know, avant-garde painters concerned with unusual representations of space and perspective. They were led by the charismatic Kazimir Malievich. Uh, and uh, in many suprematist works, you get an explicit or at least an implicit portrayal of a world without gravity, a universe without reference points. Malievich had unveiled suprematism uh, at an exhibition of futurist art in 1915 uh, with works that in their geometric, geometric, geometric shapes and colors completely dispensed with um, conventional space and perspective and things like that. And um, so this is already before the revolution. Uh, there playing with this kind of stuff. The paintings acquired, I think, a particularly compelling uh, power uh, by the juxtaposition of colors and shapes that conveyed, conveyed a continuum of space and time uh, rather than self-contained and uh, defined objects or ideas. Uh, Malievich himself called this work, uh, quote unquote, the non-objective world, uh, one that's a perception of the em environment's distilled spaciousness. Uh, such an approach naturally, I think, led many suprematist artists to first eulogize aviation and then the cosmos. And um, many suprematist paintings, uh, you can sort of cherry pick many of them in terms of their cosmic themes. Um, I'm just gonna go through a few. Um, 
Boris Anders lands cosmic, uh, I'm sorry, uh, extended space, um, um, and many others by Ender uh, um, are part of the sort of integrated view of uh, breaking down traditional art artistic modes of representing re representing space. Uh, Malievich expressed particularly interest in modern frontiers of art and science and technology, and he spent many years in pursuit of what he called the science of art. He firmly believed in the power of technological progress, and like many other intellectuals of the day, supported the perfection of nature by artificial means. Malievich wrote, I shall make my whole state comfortable and convenient, and what is more, I shall convert other states and eventually the whole globe to my comfort and convenience. Uh, Malievich's interest in spatial ideas beyond Earth first manifested themselves uh, around 1916. Uh, but there's a kind of cosmist, religious, metaphysical overtone to some of his writings. He wrote to a friend once, Earth has been abandoned like a worm-eaten house, and an inspiration, I'm sorry, and an aspiration towards space is in fact lodged in man and his consciousness, a longing to break away from the globe of the Earth. There's nothing uh, uh, technological about that. It's a kind of uh, a, a yearning, uh, uh, a will, much like Tsiolkovsky talks about the will of the human. Paintings at the time, so uh, geometric forms, squares, rectangles with hollowed out spaces and stretched drops of color drenched in white light that highlighted things unimaginable on earth without reference to any form of nature. There's literally no up and down, up or down in many of these paintings. Um, and he, in 1919, so two years after the revolution, he explicitly articulated the notion that suprematism itself could be part of the project of space exploration. And here's a quote. Between Earth and the moon, a new suprematist satellite can be constructed, equipped with every component, which will move along an orbit shaping its new track. I have ripped through the blue lampshade of, this, of the constraints of color. I've come out into the white. Follow me, comrade aviators. Swim into the abyss. I have set up the semaphores of suprematism. I've overcome the lining of the colored sky. Swim, the white free abyss, infinity is before you. Uh, so some of Melievich's paintings from this period, uh, suprematism, drawing, etc., depict, uh, which um, I'm sure some of you are familiar with, depict objects not dissimilar to what we might call space stations or futuristic cities in the cosmos. Malievich never alluded to them as such and most certainly could not have known about such things given that very few people in the world were talking about them. Yet the paintings show a remarkable understanding of the basic concepts of space travel, particularly the idea of space stations and predate similar artistic visions that were common in Soviet popular science journals much, much, much later. Uh, Malievich's just fascination with the cosmos peaked um, around 1918, 1919 when it, with his attempts to achieve an absolute spaciousness with pure whiteness, a white light of infinity that he represented in perhaps his most extreme avant-garde experiment, white square on white. Uh, like Melievich's works, many of his protégés works hinted at or more ambiguous views on space. The case of the Society of Easel Painters, which included a number of Malievich protégés, embodied the multiplicities inherent in envisioning the cosmic. Like many in the Soviet avant-garde, the Society of Easel Painters, the OST, were taken with the wonders of technology and believed that art should mirror and interpret technological advancement in both mechanistic and abstract ways. And uh, one of the people uh, that I'm most interested in is one Ivan Kudryashov, a Malievich protege who eventually gravitated to a view of the cosmos um, that was very direct. Uh, um, his father um, had been employed by Tsiolkovsky to build some of Tsiolkovsky's models. The younger Kudryashov accompanied his father on a visit to see Tsiolkovsky and translated Tsiolkovsky's technical terms for his, uh, for his father. Kudryashov's philosophy underlined in messianic essays about the expansion and settlement of humanity throughout the solar system suggested a deep affinity to the ideas of Fyodorov and Tsiolkovsky. And here are three uh, paintings by Kudryashov, Birth of the Sun, which is um, a beautiful, I think, um, composition and um, trajectory of the flight of the Earth around the sun from 1926. Um, the fascination with space bled into uh, ideas about architecture, too, at uh, the High Art and Technical Studio of Kutemas, which um, also many of you are probably familiar with, the famous Soviet art and technical school founded in 1920, where the embryonic movements of avant-garde, such as constructivism, rationalism, and suprematism were emerging. Architects such as Lazar Lisitsky and Georgi Krutikov explored a new type of architecture designed for flying cities. Uh, Krutikov's story bears worth repeating. He had been thinking of a future city in his conceptions and presented for his diploma in 1928 
a project for a flying city, a project driven at least partially by the view that because living space on Earth was limited, one had to devise other spaces for habitation. And that's, I think, a kind of Fyodorovian view, a Malthusian view. Like many constructivist architects, Krutikov firmly believed that art and architecture could be instruments of the new social order, um, and in order to, that in order to do that, architecture should expand its horizons in what he considered, considered mobile planning to adjust for all manner of new transportation, including the car, the train, the boat, the airship, the airplane, and ultimately the spaceship. In that sense, his ultimate goal was to free architecture from gravity in anticipation of the expectation that Soviet power would soon be in a position to vanquish not only the dom domination of one class by another, but also the domination of humans by gravity. Um, so here's some, um, some drawings, sketches um, of the uh, floating city. This is interesting. This is uh, the vehicle that people would use to uh, travel between different uh, different uh, floating cities, floating buildings, literally. So, uh, but I think again, this is something that uh, requires a bit more scholarship. Um, I'll come to one last thing. There's one more medium that space enthusiasts use to foster foster discussion about space travel, and that's the public exhibit. Um, after a few aborted at attempts in 1925, a number of self-described cosmopolity organized what was surely the world's first exhibition of models of interplanetary equipment, mechanisms, and historical materials in Moscow in the spring of 1927. And that's the diorama on the outside of the exhibit. And you would walk in through the door on the right. The diorama is supposed to represent a, a, a planet, uh, the surface of a planet. Um, so they called materials from a huge network of people internationally, um, including Goddard uh, in, in the US and Obert in Germany. Um, organizer Mikhail Popov described the feeling of entering the exhibition. This is a quote that he wrote down. By taking a pair of steps, I crossed over the threshold of one epoch to another into space. And the first thing you would see when you entered the exhibition is a bust of Tsiolkovsky, who was very much alive. So this was a bust. Uh, of a living person with, it's almost, um, um, and as I, I've written elsewhere, there is a kind of um, worshipful attitude towards Tsiolkovsky, almost as if, as if he's the prophet of cosmic travel and they treat and um, um, defer to him with great respect. Uh, so preserve photographs of the exhibition so of, show a very highly stylized space with curated materials describing a narrative history of space travel beginning with the science fiction of the 18th and 19th century to the sober-minded prognostications of figures such as Tsiolkovsky and Goddard and Oberth. Um, the show was held without state support, um, so they raised money for it themselves, and was a major success. According to the organizers, in the course of two months, between 10 and 12,000 people visited the exhibition. Uh, they included school children, workers, uh, uh, factory workers, artists, scientists, policemen, and such luminaries as the Soviet, very famous Soviet poet, poet Vladimir Miakovsky. Visitors were also invited to record their impressions um, and on, a, on this sort of book, a comments book, which I've seen. Uh, one person who signed as Goryev wrote, our mind is not accustomed to all the wonderful un unknown which I have literally seen and heard, as if in a dream, and yet we understand that this is not a fantasy but a completely feasible idea supported by the achievements of science and engineering. Another person, an artist working for a film studio said, it would be desirable that our inventors achieve the first landing of the moon. Um, Another person, a reporter for a worker's daily wrote, I'm going to accompany you on the first flight to the moon. I'm quite serious about this. As soon as I heard what you had done, I tried in every way to make certain that you would take me with you. Please do not refuse my request. It's a little bit of a threat there, but. Uh, so these are some images. Um, this is a kind of a schematic of a mechanism for flight. Um, these are the organizers of the exhibition. And one of the interesting things they did, they also created an artificial language to talk, which is why it's very difficult to decipher the records. And they also renamed themselves, inter, they gave themselves interplanetary names. Um, so for example, the woman Olga Kolopsieva re renamed herself Ifof B, which was that they had a mathematical formula for renaming themselves. Uh, so this is you walk into the exhibition and that's Nautilus from uh, the Jules Verne novel, uh, 20,000 leagues under the sea, yeah. Um, 
And, um, but then you get into the space part of it, uh, which is the Goddard rocket. And that's actually a very interesting close uh, a facsimile of the rocket itself. Uh, Goddard had sent uh, one of his articles to the organizers. And then you have the rocket of Max Vallier, who was a German rocket enthusiast, which they built and hung from the ceiling. Here is um, various um, drawings of early uh, prognostications of space flight, a section devoted particularly to Max Vallier, uh, who was a very famous sort of personality in Moscow. Um, the, the top left corner is the model, and the lower right corner is the image. The image was built by a guy named Friedrich Sander, who developed this rocket plane spaceship that would fly in space, but use its own wings as fuel, melted into its fuel tanks. Um, a very original idea, which nobody's really been able to do yet, but, uh, <laughs> but what they did was they built the drawing that he did, they built a model out of his imagination and displayed it. Um, so, how does this all end? By the mid-1930s, the Soviet space fad was essentially over. Some have suggested that there was deliberate suppression of such ut utopian ideas, the state having equated cosmonautics with idle diversions from the more urgent matters of the day, particularly Soviet industrialization and collectivization. There's some truth to this, but one must keep in mind that the Soviet Bolshevik Party and the, and the government rarely, if ever, supported the space fad and said, almost very, or said very little about it, uh, at least in the 1920s. And while it is true that the Bolsheviks began to publicly, publicly exalt and honor Tsiolkovsky in the 1930s, in the last three years of his life, much of the state's eagerness had to do less with Tsiolkovsky's chosen interests, such as airship design or space travel, than the fact that he was a self-educated person who was able to be creative outside of the old elitist system of education and science in Russia. The space fad, which was fostered by the dissemination of science fiction, ended in the mid-1930s, not because of the state's active efforts to eliminate such utopian ideals, although that was certainly part of it, but I think there were also more benign reasons. First, the private uh, publishing concerns disappeared, which had been the biggest sponsors of this literature. The, many of the magazines disappeared. Uh, because they were essentially profit-driven in the 1920s. Second, the growing national fascination with aviation had more inspirational power as a marker of modernity for a populace turning away from idle dreaming uh, who had you know, sort of absorbed these sort of utopian space discourses and refashioned it into something more real. Uh, in fact, the, by the mid-1930s, the terminology of interplanetary travel receded in favor of the more real goals in line of jet propulsion or stratospheric flight. Um, and also, I should I, I can explain in the Q and A, but many of the people who architects of this died in the purges or in World War II. Uh, people have often compared the Russian fascination with space with the fascina fascination with airplanes, but the dream of space flight in the 1920s differed in two significant ways. I think, first, space flight, space travel, which is also about liberation from the Earth, just like aviation, pushed the physical limits of emancipation beyond conception past the boundaries of the visible skies into something you can't imagine. Second, space flight was entirely a discourse of fantasy. Voyages beyond the atmosphere had no precedent or template. Uh, you could see an airplane fly, but you had no idea what a spaceship might look like when it was flying. Liberation and fantasy in one shape or other are common to most utopian dreams, but by extending liberation into space, and pushing utopian speculations beyond reality into fantasy, the spaceflight discourse was infused with a kind of universal, in both senses of the word, appeal that aviation lacked. For a brief period in the 1920s, spaceflight was the most potent manifestation of this fantasy of liberation, and indeed may have been a kind of liberation of fantasy. The speculations about spaceflight would not have been possible without the promise of 20th century technology or the promise of it. Uh, that made the utopias of liberation and fantasy attainable. So as a single force, I think, a combination of technology, fantasy, and liberation, space exploration promised what aviation could only offer in part, a total kind of liberation from the signifiers of the past, which was social injustice, imperfection, gravity, and ultimately the Earth. Thank you. Thank you.